take this giant leap with me into the other world, the other place, where language fails and imagery defies, denies man's consciousness and dies upon the altar of insanity. Come, take this giant leap with me into the other world, the other place, and trace the eclipse of humanity where children burned while mankind stood by and the universe has yet to learn why. Good afternoon. My name is Rick Mann and I'm the chairperson for the Yom HaShoah Commemoration Committee. On behalf of the committee, JCRC, and its community partners, Welcome to the virtual Greater Boston Community Holocaust Commemoration of Yom HaShoah. It is hard to believe that a full year after our first ever Yom HaShoah Commemoration, we find ourselves here once again, the victims of a solitude imposed by a pernicious disease. We are fortunate that there are now vaccinations slowly making their way into our arms, and that there is a growing confidence that eventually this disease that has so far claimed the lives of two and a half million people including more than 500,000 Americans, will soon be eradicated. If only we could eradicate the disease of hatred, bigotry, and intolerance with a similar vaccination. We gather today as we do every year to recall the memory of six million human beings whose lives were extinguished in the fires of the Holocaust for the crime of being born Jewish. We mourn their loss and we express gratitude for those who miraculously survived. We remain in awe of each and every one of them for their ability to persevere, to pick themselves up from the ashes of destruction, to journey to new lands, learn new languages, and not only survive, but to thrive. One of the most important and effective ways our community has sought to preserve our collective memory is through the creation of the New England Holocaust Memorial. And today, we commemorate the 25th anniversary of the dedication of this memorial. Contemplating what it has come to mean and the role it will continue to play in the preservation of memory. As we vow to sustain this memory and to honor the legacy of our survivors, we will cross the bridge to the future through the words of young students and the children and grandchildren of survivors who are charged by fate with the sacred obligation to carry forward the memories of their loved ones, the lessons they have been taught, and to speak the truth of what they suffered as they are the witnesses to the witnesses. Throughout our commemoration, you will see quotes from the winners of this year's Israel Arbeiter Holocaust Essay Contest, chosen from among scores of essays submitted by Greater Boston Area Middle and High School students, each of which gives reason for hope for a future of understanding, tolerance, and compassion. As we do each year, we will now honor the memory of the six million through the lighting of the candles. Oif in Pripeci, gebrennt a Feierl, und in Stubis Heis, und der Rebeller und kleine Kindeloch, dem alle Feis, und der Rebeller und kleine Kindeloch, dem alle Feis. Lerent kindeloch, mit größen Geisch, as oi so kich on, wes du gich e fun eich kennen ivere, de bakum ta fon, zog je noch amol, und zog je noch amol, kom et alle Ner Hashem nishmat adam, the candle of the Lord is the human soul. From these words in the book of Proverbs, we take the custom of lighting a candle on the yurt site, the anniversary of the death of loved ones. Of those who survived the Holocaust, most lost someone, some lost many, and others, like my father, lost everyone. Of the six million who perished, most were never properly laid to rest in a cemetery marked with a gravestone where loved ones could visit. We will never know how many of those who perished left no one to remember them, no one to mourn for them, 
no one to recite Kaddish or light a Yorzeit candle in tribute to them. We gather here today online to honor those that we may never have known, but who are part of us and who must be remembered. We light these candles in honor of the six million as we remember them. We also take a moment here to remember the soldiers, the liberators, the veterans, to whom we owe the utmost gratitude and appreciation for their efforts in saving us. For many years, I worked with a woman who was born during the war. She never met her father. He perished in Europe when his Jeep hit a mine. We light this candle in gratitude to the United States military with appreciation for all that they sacrificed to help save us. We also remember people from our community who are no longer with us, and we honor them. Joel Dembling, second generation survivor, and you may recall his dear father, David Dembling, who for many years sung the partisan hymn at this observance. remember Steve Ross, who came to this country as an orphan of the war, along with my father and others, aboard a U.S. military vessel. Steve Ross, we owe a tremendous gratitude for, because without his efforts and the efforts of the survivors that worked with him, the New England Holocaust Memorial site would never have been built. We remember Greta Beer. Greta brought to the world's attention the artwork that had been stolen from the homes and businesses of those who perished during the Holocaust. We remember Sarah Lewin, survivor, wife of Harvey Lewin, who today at over 100 years old, is the oldest member of our community of survivors. He witnessed the massacre of his entire family below the ghetto where they lived. We remember Rachel Cott Lewis, second generation survivor. Her father was a partisan. Her brother Isaac heads up generations after. We remember Sam Weinrub, survivor, who recently lost his wife Goldie, also a survivor. Sam came to this community after retiring to be closer to his daughter. And in a very short period of time, he became very close to all of us as well. We remember Ingrid Kisliuk, survivor, and her husband, Roy. COVID affected many communities and ours were certainly one of them. Ingrid died just 11 days after her husband from COVID. A flickering candle reminds us of the flame of a life that once burned brightly and illuminated the lives of loved ones. May we continue for many years to come 
to pay homage to those who perished and to honor the survivors in our community. May the six million rest in peace, knowing that there were survivors and that we will not allow their lives to have been taken in vain or forgotten. Thank you. It is customary to say the Kaddish, the Mourner's Kaddish. As many of you know, the Mourner's Kaddish does not in any way mention death. Rather, it mentions the expansion and enlarging of our lives and bringing divinity back into the world, a world that has been bereft of the holy and pure. So as we are able to say the Kaddish together, let us keep in mind that one of the ways we can truly keep the memory of those alive is by living our lives in a larger way. The Mourner's Kaddish, Kaddish Yatom. Yit Kadal v'yit Kadash Shemei Rabbah V'yalma divra chirutei V'yamlich malchutei V'chayechon v'yomechon U'v'chaye d'chol bet Yisrael V'agala u'v'zman kariv v'yimru amen Yehe Shemei Rabbah mevorach L'olam olmei olmaya Yit parach v'yishtabach v'yit po'ar v'yitromam v'yit nase V'yitadar v'yitale v'yitalal Shemei d'kudisha b'richu Leila min kol birchata v'shirata Tush bechata v'nechemata d'amiran b'alma v'yimru amen Yehe shlom araba min shemaya V'chayim aleinu v'al kol Yisrael v'yimru amen Ose shalom b'mromav hu yase shalom Aleinu v'al kol Yisrael v'al kol yoshvei tevel v'yimru amen May the one who brings peace to the universe Bring peace to us and all the people Israel and all who dwell on this earth and let us say Amen. It is customary at memorial services to sing the memorial prayer El Kol Rachamim. I would like very much to also mention my parents, my mother Bronya Lipnitska from Sosnovitz and my father Yidl Valdox from Lutsk in the Ukraine, who my father a sole survivor and my mother a survivor with only a few members of her family and may their memories be a blessing for all of us. El Molir Rachamim. Exalted, compassionate God, grant perfect peace in your sheltering presence among the holy and the pure to the souls who are our brethren, our men, women, and children of the house of Israel who were slaughtered and burned. And may their memory endure, inspiring truth and loyalty in our lives. And may their souls be bound up in the bond of life. May they rest in peace, and let us say Amen. <speaking in Hebrew> Shimodehori <laughs> Hanatsim yim khoshimam Vigan eden Tehem enuchatam Anam barachamim Hastireim beseter genovechole olamim Utsror vetsor achayim Et nishmoteem Adonai unachalatam Venomar Amen I swore never to be silent 
whenever and wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation, wherever men or women are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that place must, at that moment, become the center of the universe. I was going to end my talk uh, with some comments about Kelly, but I think I'll start. Holocaust was inside him, and he, in some ways, was the first to really start talking about it in an interpretive way. And his interpretation became enormous solace for survivors everywhere. We didn't know how to talk about it. We didn't talk about it because the first thing when we came after the war, people told you, don't tell anything what happened. That's past and that should be forgotten. Somehow, I don't want it to be forgotten. It's the memory of my family, of my parents who perished, and I think the children, especially my family, should know about their great-grandparents. They were beautiful human beings and happy and good people, and they were murdered, and so we, I would answer every question and tell them about it. What happened to me and other people happened in our time, in this world, on this planet, and it was real. What I know about myself is that I am the survivor of a genocide. Uh, and with that comes having a certain amount of trauma that while I and others like myself on a good day have learned to cope with, it never goes away. You have to speak up. You can't be silent. I am alive because uh, there are people who spoke up and who not only spoke up, who acted and took terrible risks. And I'm alive because of that. At age 13, actually a couple of weeks before I had my birthday, I was coming home from a bar mitzvah lesson and found our home locked and no one there. San Weinreb wasn't even a teenager, yet on that terrible day in March 1941, when he returned to his empty home in Bratislava, Czechoslovakia, he had narrowly missed the Nazi roundup of the Jews in Bratislava, who numbered nearly 15,000 people. They were expelled or sent to concentration camps, where most perished. That afternoon was the last time I ever saw or spoke to any member of my family. The thing that I, I'm really impressed with and struck by is how long it takes for these effects, how long these effects persevere in the population, the effects of this horrible, horrible past and the horrible losses, that they are really passed down to the third generation and probably beyond. Well, I am sort of kind of, uh, I occupy a sort of dual place. I am a child of survivors and I'm a survivor myself. So my children are either the second generation or the first generation, it's not clear really. And they have had to struggle with these effects as all children of survivors have to. After a while we could hear the soldiers' footsteps again, but instead of approaching our room, they were moving away. Then, finally, the commotion ended. It was eerily quiet. And finally, we began to hear the squealing sounds of steel and steel. The train was finally beginning to pull away. As you can imagine, there was total jubilation in our room. Everyone was hugging everyone else. We had survived another day. So who would have ever imagined, especially my mother, when she wrote in her first letter after liberation that somewhere there must still be a son and perhaps again the rebuilding of a new life. For most of my life, I never talked about my Holocaust experiences, mostly 
because I didn't think anybody who didn't go through such experiences would have any way to understand them. It was only when I realized how important my mother's Terezin album was and how meaningful it was for other people. I became, at the age of 85 or so, very interested in telling my story. My name is Munoz Rzewski, now known as Sidney Handler. After the war, many years later, I read a book written by Itzhak Arad. He was a survivor of the with the partisans in Vilna. And according to his, to his book, from the 65,000 people or 75,000 Jews that lived in Vilna in the beginning of the German entry into Vilna, at the time of the liberation, 200 people were inside the city of Vilna. 200 Jews out of 60 to 75,000. I was one of the 200. Mama, Mama, I'm screaming as I run from the line at morning roll call in the French camp. Please take me with you. But I am denied a precious hug or her words of comfort as my young German mother is shoved onto a cattle car headed to Auschwitz. It's 1942. I am three years old. Well, my name is Rina Finder, and I was born in Krakow, Poland. And I'm a survivor because I was on Schindler's List. Well, I was 10 years old when Germany invaded Poland. And so overnight, from being a little girl, I became an enemy of the state. And our crime was that we were Jewish. You cannot really believe it, that human beings can be able to do such horrible things and get away with it. My diaspora is an assembled bronze sculpture I created to commemorate the very personal and tragic history of my family's dissolution and partial destruction. The sculpture memorializes the permanent separation of the men in my family, my father, my brother Gus, and myself, from the women, my mother, my sister, and my paternal grandmother. Soon after Kristallnacht, when I was three and a half, neither group ever saw the other again. My name is Esther Adler, and I wrote the poem that I will read to you now. It is called Shema Yisrael. Stifled, suffering in the suffocating Lublin ghetto, a young girl furtively escapes the narrow, confining streets. She leaves behind her mother, five sisters, severing bonds with her past, hoping to return to rescue. Her eyes downcast, evading stares of strangers, meeting smiles with a faint response, asking, who am I? To whom do I belong? Alone, her heartbeat her only companion, urging, repeating a rhythm, a pattern, a clear, constant, monotone refrain. Go on, survive. Go on, survive. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Gripped by fear, Shaken, shattered, she at once discerns its meaning. She wants to turn, to run, escape the scene of death, destruction. She cannot move, she stands still, as if rooted to the very ground, until the last note fades, drifts like a whiff of smoke toward heaven, toward a silent, distant God. Shema Yisrael, Shema Yisrael. Where is the Lord our God? 
Israel Arbeiter was 14 years old when the Germans first entered his city of Plotsk, Poland, in early September 1939. First came the German army, then the SS, and Gestapo. And on the next five and a half years, I was imprisoned. I was a slave, condemned to death, for the only crime I have committed because I was born to Jewish parents. When I arrived in Auschwitz, those there were a selection conducted by uh, Dr. Mengelis and other doctors. And there were two groups of people. One was to the left and one to the right. Those that were placed, let's say, to the right were shipped directly to the guest chambers and killed automatically. The other group, which according to the Nazis, were young and strong enough and will be able to perform slave labor because the uh, German military needed uh, uh, slaves, needed workers. So how to keep uh, control over the prisoners that were placed in the camp, they tattooed us. And I also got a tattoo on my, on my left arm. And I was not called Izzy Arbeiter, I was called Slave uh, Prisoner, number 18,651. Survivors of major traumas, whether it was the Holocaust or a tsunami or something that affected an individual very individually, will use a memorial as a place in which to mourn. Steve Ross was a man with a dream. He yearned for a place to mourn the family members he lost in the Shoah, whose final resting places are forever unknown place for reflection, a place for remembering, a place for education, and perhaps above all, a place for hope. Hope for a world free from hatred, bigotry, and intolerance. Steve Ross's dream became a reality. It was the culmination of years of tireless efforts by dedicated committees comprised of survivors, Jewish and non-Jewish community leaders, and local and state political leaders. In the fall of 1995, 25 years ago, as members of the Greater Boston community gathered near Faneuil Hall to dedicate a memorial to the victims of the darkest moment in human history. So my dad founded the Holocaust Memorial in downtown Boston, the New England Holocaust Memorial. And initially his reason for doing so was a couple reasons, I think. One, we had nowhere to go for our family that was murdered. 
we have no cemeteries, we have no, um, you know, there's nowhere to, to, to pray, you know, for our, for our family. So it's in some way, for my father and for some of the other survivors, it serves as a gathering place, like a cemetery almost. But also, it's a symbol of our values, of who we are as a city here in Boston or New England. It's a symbol in the middle of the city, in the middle of downtown Boston, where there may or may not be a lot of Jewish people. This city is saying, this is what we value. To get that memorial built, I mean, he just, he didn't stop. He went to the mayor at the time, Ray Flynn, and said, you know, can you give us land? The mayor gave him land. My father knew that he had to make it bigger than just something for the Jewish people. It needed to be something for all people and to be a grand statement. My father had to really kind of pull people together uh, and, and they did, and they did, and they came together and they built it. It took many years and a lot of work, but he got it done. Public art, if it is to both reflect the public and teach the public, needs to come in some sense from the public. And in that sense, we needed to have an open competition. And we learned from James Young, our scholar, that the act of creating the memorial itself, that the act of submissions and the uh, exhibition of submissions was in itself a way of memorializing the Holocaust. And so we did it. And then I began to think about the kind of symbols that are involved with the Jewish tradition, the six-pointed star, the menorah, and then the six million and the six death camps. And um, when I went back to my hotel that evening, I just drew six little towers on the pad on um, the bedside table. And um, the more I began to think about that sketch, the more meanings began to attach to it. The design features six glass towers, each 54 feet high. Six million numbers, suggestive of the infamous tattoos the Nazis inflicted on their victims, are etched in the glass. Personal quotations from Holocaust survivors and witnesses are etched on both sides of each tower. These voices of the persecuted provide a window to the past, from the horrors of camp life to acts of resistance and escape. As visitors leave the memorial, they read the legendary quote of Martin Niemöller, inviting them to contemplate the universal issues of prejudice and persecution. My name is Steve Ross. The truth is unspeakable and unfathomable. I stand here before you as a survivor and as a witness to the authenticity of the darkest chapter in the history of man's inhumanity to man. I am deeply indebted to all those people who have made this vital historical landmark possible. My dream has now become a reality because of you. May the souls of our lost loved ones find peace here at this resting place. You will look at these towers. I hope that when you will look at them, you will stop for a second. Just for one second. And try to remember one of those children, a face, a smile, catch a word, seize a prayer, take a dream that was muted, a dream that was killed. Take and take what you can. And so for that second, you too will be part of an extraordinary story that no one can remember, but no one should forget. Who would have thought at that time that this memorial would soon join the ranks of the Jefferson Memorial in the Vietnam War Memorial as the recipient of the prestigious Henry Bacon Award for Architecture. Who could have conceived that the memorial would become a landmark in a city of landmarks? 
Who would have dreamed that in the next quarter of a century that countless student groups from all over New England would visit the memorial led by a generation of teachers and educational leaders who have recognized the importance, indeed the urgency, of imbuing the lessons of the Holocaust in young people? How could we have imagined that literally millions of people would have walked through the memorial's six glass towers, some as a destination and others by happenstance, but virtually all to become mesmerized by its beauty and engrossed in the horrifying historical chronology and personal vignettes etched on its granite walkway and glass walls? Who would have believed that this memorial would become the focal point for important human rights demonstrations including those decrying genocide in Bosnia, Darfur, Rwanda, religious intolerance in China, and prejudice and bigotry here and throughout the world. Steve Ross's dream of a memorial in the heart of the city of Boston along the Freedom Trail could never have been achieved without the unswerving support of then Boston Mayor Ray Flynn, influenced without question by Steve's legendary dedication and persistence. In keeping with that support, we have been honored and privileged to have been joined at virtually every community Yom HaShoah commemoration at Faneuil Hall by Boston's mayors, including Mayor Flynn, Mayor Tom Menino, and Mayor Marty Walsh. Continuing that tradition, this afternoon, we are pleased and honored to be joined by Acting Mayor Kim Janey. My name is Kim Janey. I want to begin by thanking Jeremy and Aaron for inviting me to offer remarks today. We are gathered virtually to recognize Holocaust Remembrance Day and the 25th anniversary of the dedication of the New England Holocaust Memorial. The location of the memorial on Boston's Freedom Trail signifies the deep relationship between the city of Boston and the Jewish community. It also marks our commitment to ensuring that this horrific period of time is never forgotten. We are committed to standing united against hatred and anti-Semitism. We are also committed to honoring Holocaust survivors and their families. We will carry on their legacy and share their stories. It was incredibly moving when I traveled to Israel a couple of years ago. And I want to uh, thank JCRC for inviting me on that learning journey and for inviting me to be a part of this important day. Even in these challenging times, it is important to come together as a community. We honor the memory of Holocaust victims and we must ensure that this historic tragedy is never forgotten and never repeated. Let us all continue to work on educating the next generation. May they be a light to lead us. May we all continue our commitment to the words, never again. Thank you. Thank you, Acting Mayor Janey. So what of the future of the memorial? Is it still relevant? Is it still needed? Consider this. A mere 82 years from the horrific night of broken glass, crystal knock only 77 years from the liberation of the death camps, while the nearly universal mantras of never forget and never again still resonate in our collective ears, we face what many believe to be a rising tide of anti-Semitism. We have witnessed the overt unbridled displays of bigotry and blatant anti-Semitism in Charlottesville. We have watched our own country close its borders to the persecuted and oppressed and wrest children from their mother's arms among many recent manifestations of a burgeoning xenophobia. We have witnessed the loss of Jewish lives at prayer in this country. And closer to home, we have seen arson at area synagogues in Arlington and Needham. And we have experienced our own Kristallnacht with the shattering of the glass panels of the memorial, not once, but twice in the past three years. The 17-year-old boy has been charged with vandalizing Boston's Holocaust Memorial. Police say the teen threw a rock at the memorial, breaking a glass panel. Those in the Jewish community say this is disheartening because this already happened earlier this summer. It's almost shocking to us that we are back here 
six weeks later. Uh, it's shocking to us to be here after the events of this last weekend in Virginia. It's shocking to us to be here a day after Mayor Walsh and Governor Baker brought together the interfaith community and political leadership just across the street in front of City Hall to say that there was no space for hate in Boston. But here we are again for the second time this summer. The New England Holocaust Memorial has been desecrated after 22 years of being untouched. The Jewish community reacted with understandable shock and revulsion. Thankfully, we were not alone. On each occasion, we were quickly joined at the site of the memorial by members of the interfaith community, political leaders, and others, and declared never again in a strong, united voice for all to hear. Not here, not in this country, not in this city. It gave us renewed hope that this was just an ugly aberration and in a display of strength and perseverance worthy of our survivor community we quickly replaced the broken glass panels and rededicated the memorial to the purposes for which it was created to renew this memorial to rededicate this memorial and to speak to its importance here on the freedom trail is especially important for us because as we know, the freedom, the people sailed in very small boats across an ocean and really did take their lives and the lives of everybody that was with them into God's hands. It's about freedom of religion. To the Holocaust survivors in our city, I know seeing this memorial damage was very painful to you. The same goes to the families of the Holocaust survivors and members of the Jewish community. In truth, our entire city was affected. This memorial means a lot to all of us. It stands as a symbol of everything that we want to be as a city. It also stands as a symbol of democracy and of freedom. It stands as a clear commitment that we will never forget what happened during the Holocaust. We will never forget the lives and the legacies of the victims on these glass walls. As a city, as a country, we promise to ensure it never happens again. The memorial remains an important bulwark in our efforts to ensure that never again are more than just idle words. And today we are pleased to introduce a glimpse at an innovation in progress, a virtual visitor's experience, which will make it even more effective in its mission. Through the use of 21st century technology, we will soon be able to make the memorial even more impactful to students and other visitors to the actual memorial. Using survivor voices, the virtual visitor's experience provides access to the memorial to visitors from all over the world and creates a modern tool to continue the transmission of memory and to honor the legacy of victims and survivors in future generations. I'm picking up where he left off, but the hard part was getting the thing going in the first place. We definitely have a responsibility, um, the, the children of Holocaust survivors, to tell the story about the Holocaust, to be on guard uh, for genocides that are occurring on our watch, to call out hatred. It was so important for him to build a memorial. It was so important for him to get the book published. It was so important for his documentary to come out. It was so important for him to teach kids, talk to kids. I just feel like I have a duty to keep that going. In the case of young people, they will learn. For as the years go by, our generations have a responsibility to pass our direct knowledge 
on to our young people. That is why every year, with our Holocaust Memorial at City Hall, we will seek to involve the young people of Boston so they, they will know the truth. I'm very fortunate to be able to speak to thousands of students every year. I tell them about my, my difficult life, my survival. I want them to realize that this is not just my own story. It's, a story, it's their story also. Um, it's the kind of person that they want to become, the kinds of choices and de decisions that they will be making, and to be aware and understand the dangers of prejudice, of discrimination, um, of any type of intolerance. And uh, it's my hope that they are able to stand up to any type of ingest, injustice. And there's a quote that I really love by Elie Wiesel. There may be times when we can't prevent injustice, but there must never be a time when we fail to protest. My mom, you know, she, she endured so much, and her father endured so much, and her mother gave up her life. But the truth is, the bigger part of my mom's story is that it was one kind, selfless human being. One kind, selfless human being who made one choice in one moment that I'm sitting here and my best friend, my mom, is sitting here. I really want kids to hear. It doesn't have to be something huge. They don't have to change the world in a grand sense. You just have to change a little piece of it, one little piece at a time. Her story and her legacy will live on through me, through my brothers, my children, my nieces and my nephew, and hopefully all of the people that she touches throughout her incredible life. If I make sure that I share my mother's story in a way that has an impact on you, and then you in turn share her story in a way that has an impact on others, then perhaps we can succeed in never letting people forget that the Holocaust is not simply just one big chapter, but millions of real life experiences and smaller stories that ultimately changed millions of other lives forever. So I think it is, you know, my responsibility to tell their story because this can never happen again. But it's also my responsibility to tell the story of how they made a life because that is a huge lesson of resilience and of strength that everybody needs to learn from. I think back to my grandmother talking about how the war started and how no one thought it was going to be what it turned out to be and how they got the newspaper and they heard on the radio, you know, that the Germans were invading, but they never thought that they were gonna come to their small town. I watch the news and that's all I hear in my head is, oh, well, that's happening here, that's happening there, but it's, is it gonna come to my small town sometime soon? You never think it's gonna be you until it is. These stories are not gonna be forgotten because they're more important to tell now than ever. As the grandchild of a survivor, I think that it's really important that um, we know these stories and that we share these stories. And so it then became my mission as the grandchild to learn the story and share that story and make sure that those deniers and anyone who said that this didn't happen knows that firsthand from my grandmother's mouth, it happened and six million Jews were killed and here is her story and this is my story. So for me, I know that I'm the last generation to hear these stories firsthand. We need to teach people not to be silent, to be upstanders and not bystanders, and we need to show what hatred can do. As we prepare to read Anne Frank, I show the students news clips about the concentration camps to help them better understand and build backgrounds 
And that's when the whispering started. A few students told others that the Holocaust never happened, that Anne Frank was a fictional character. The whispers grew louder, and a handful of students argued back, but the majority of the class simply sat and watched and listened, the silent bystanders. I knew my words would never be powerful enough to erase that hint of denial, or whatever influences would ever make a 13-year-old believe the Holocaust never occurred. That night, I searched for a primary source, someone who lived the truth of the Holocaust and would be willing to share it with my students. I found articles about Israel Arbeiter. He told his story, and that is how they learned the truth. They promised they would remember. These lessons have settled into the foundations of our school building, into the corners of our classroom, and nudge our kids to do the right thing, to remember, to be an upstander. The rock dropped into the pond creates many countless ripples. How will we remember? How will we never forget what has brought us here? We will remember by continuing to have commemorations such as this. We will remember by persons like me continuing to tell this story as long as we are able. But most importantly, the world will remember only if we continue to educate our next generations by the talented young people here today who participated in the Izzy Arbeiter contest. You're going to be the leaders, the future leaders of Slovakia and uh, leaders of the world, the United Nations, the leaders of the world. And you might have in the future the power to prevent a place like this to exist. So again, it's an honor for me to speak with you, to meet you. Enjoy the day, enjoy your life and go home and tell your parents, your families, what you learned, what you saw here. And remember that only good people can prevent a catastrophe like this what took place here from happening again. Learn what you see and remember what you learn. We close our commemoration today with words and music that speak to the importance of future generations and our critical role in leading them in the right path towards making the world a more just and harmonious place, free from the yoke of hatred that has bound humanity in the past. Thank you all for joining us, and hopefully we will join together safely and in good health next year at Faneuil Hall. Careful the wish you make, wishes our children. Careful the path they take, wishes come true. Not free. Careful the spell you cast, not just on children. Sometimes the spell may last past what you can see and turn against you. Careful the tale you tell, that is the spell. Children will listen.